County. Thank you for joining us in the first of our three-part series on food insecurity and hunger in Bucks County. Today we'll be discussing hungry families, a problem which is larger than many of us are aware. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website and our Facebook page. The League of Women Voters is a century old organization dedicated to encouraging informed and active participation in government. We're nonpartisan and we never support or oppose candidates or parties, but we do study issues of importance to voters and we take positions on those issues. Local, state and federal governments make laws and spend money in ways that impact for better or for worse local problems such as food insecurity. We as voters need to understand those issues so that we can hold our legislators accountable. We hope that this series of programs will help you understand the scope of the problem and to learn what we as citizens can do about it. League members, Kathy Beveridge and Liz Fritch will be hosting this panel discussion. Liz will be the discussion moderator and Kathy will be our Zoom host. Kathy, will you begin? Welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, it's my pleasure to give everybody a tour of the webinar window on a quick, uh, a quick overview of what it can do. If you don't see one of the options that I'm talking about, uh, click on the ellipsis the three dots and you'll see some additional options. And hopefully now you can see that we have enabled closed caption live transcript feature for today's program. We hope it is useful to you. If you like it, do nothing and it will continue throughout the program. If you'd rather not uh, see the captions, hover your cursor over the window where you see me talking so that the tools appear along the bottom of the window. Click on the little CC box and choose to disable the feature. Um, the captions tend to appear at the bottom of the window where you see me talking. If you want to move them to another location, you can click on the box where the words are appearing and drag it to another location in the window. Participants don't need to worry about being seen or heard during this program. In a Zoom webinar, participants are not visible and they engage in the discussion through the Q&A feature and the chat box. We're encouraging you to engage in our discussion using the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. Feel free to put your questions in whenever you like. Type in your question. If you like, you can put in parentheses the name of the panelist that you'd like to answer the question. And if you see that somebody else has already asked the question that you wanted to ask, feel free to upvote that question by clicking on the thumbs up icon next to the question and we'll get to as many questions as possible during the session. Note, uh, when the Q&A box is open, you can drag it away from the faces of the panelists if, if it's in your way. So please do be sure to type your questions in the Q&A section, not the chat window. We are only using the chat to share some supplemental information with you, like any websites that are mentioned by the panelists. You can copy them from the chat window and paste them into a Word document so you can visit those sites after the webinar. So enjoy the conversation. And Liz, it's all yours. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we are here today to begin a conversation about hunger in Bucks County. This is not a new issue, but COVID has increased the reach, magnitude, and visibility of food insecurity in our region and we hope that this new awareness will lead to action to address a problem that is all too real to many families living among us in Bucks County. We are very fortunate today to have an excellent panel with us to help us understand the extent and nature of hunger in Bucks County. They represent three agencies who work every day to address food insecurity. They work with families, with children, the elderly and the disabled, and they see firsthand the impact that hunger has on people's lives. So I'd like to introduce our three panelists. The first is Tim Philpot. He is the Director of Financial Stability and Health 
for United Way of Bucks County, where he oversees the organization's investments in fighting food insecurity and homelessness. He is the project lead for United Way's annual Bucks Knocks Out Hunger campaign, and he is the secretary for the Hunger Nutrition Coalition of Bucks County. A self-professed data geek, Tim has an affinity for program evaluation and data gathering. He holds a master's degree in psychology from Villanova University. So welcome, Tim. Thank you. Uh, the second speaker is Heather Four. She is the director of client services at the Bucks County Opportunity Council, where she oversees the food program along with the emergency and economic self-sufficiency programs. The Opportunity Council is the primary anti-poverty program in the county. Heather is the co-chair of the Hunger Coalition, of the Hunger Nutrition Coalition of Bucks County. She was instrumental in the implementation of the Fresh Connect Bucks County program, a distribution of fresh produce that takes place weekly at three locations. She holds a bachelor's degree in finance from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Heather, for being here. Finally, we have Kristen Chapin. She is the associate director for the YWCA of Bucks County, where she is responsible for aligning program and resource development with the Y's mission, vision, and values. The YWCA is committed to eliminating racism, empowering women, strengthening families, standing up for social justice, and supporting communities. The YWCA in Bucks County is particularly known for its work with immigrant families. Kristen holds a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice, minor in Psychology from Temple University, and a Master of Science in Nonprofit Leadership from LaSalle University. So thank you, Kristen, for being with us today. So we'll start off with Tim. I'm going to ask him to provide us with some definitions, some numbers, and an overview, which will provide a framework for our further discussion. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Liz, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am Tim Philpott from United Way of Bucks County, and it's my pleasure to speak with you this morning. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the League for taking up um, this issue. I think it's a very important one. So thank you in advance for your work and for, for this series. Um, so I am here today to, to talk about some basics, uh, of give a large overview, high level overview of uh, hunger and food insecurity in the county. Um, and we'll get our slides up here in just a second. Okay. So I think you can go advance forward, Kathy. Very good. So first, basic definitions. You know, what is food insecurity? Uh, we have definitions from both the World Health Organization and USDA. Um, the World Health Organization defines it as being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable nutritious food. The USDA definition is very similar. It's a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active and healthy life. And you'll see that both definitions uh, have the same or very similar three elements, the consistency of access to food, the quantity of food that's available, and food that promotes health. And all three are Im important elements. More informally, we would describe food insecurity as simply not always being sure where your next meal is coming from. So I think it goes without saying that food is one of our most basic needs. And I think it's worth remembering that according to Maslow, I think you all may remember Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs from your entry site courses. Uh, according to Maslow, it's hard to achieve higher order needs if our most basic needs aren't met. So in the hierarchy, food comes before things like safety, relationships, or accomplishments. And as one food pantry manager I know and work with says, you know, when you're truly hungry, you can't think or focus on anything else. So achieving higher order, goal, order goals is, is really difficult. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the impacts of food insecurity are broad and cross-cutting. I think we all know that when children are hungry, they aren't able to pay attention or learn very well. Uh, but food uh, insecurity is also associated with a higher risk of depression and heart attack among seniors. It makes adults less product productive, more susceptible to illness, less able to concentrate. And among all groups, food insecurity is associated with higher rates of anxiety, I think for obvious reasons. Next slide, please. So who in Bucks County is food insecure? Um, Unfortunately, there's no population level survey of Bucks County residents to see who reports being food insecure. So we have to rely on a couple of things, estimates and, and projections. Feeding America is the nation's largest food relief organization and it's comprised of a network of over 400 food banks. And it provides projections of the scope of food insecurity county by county across the nation. And these projections are based on an index of cost of living, employment data, rates of disability, a couple of other factors uh, that go into the projection. And the other thing that we rely on is census data on poverty. And while food insecurity and poverty are not the same thing, uh, poverty rates are a fair proxy uh, for food insecurity. Next slide, please. So according to Feeding America, about 7.1% of all people in Bucks County are considered food insecure as of 2018, pre-pandemic. Pre and about 9.4% of children in Bucks County were food insecure. And just for some context, uh, five or six years ago, it was about 10% of uh, all Bucks County residents and 16% of children. So we have made progress over the last uh, se uh, several years. Uh, at least up until the pandemic struck. Next slide. In terms of poverty, uh, data for Bucks County, our overall poverty rate is about 5.7%. It's higher among females than males. Um, among whiter Caucasian people, it's estimated to be at 4.9%. Uh, among Black or African American people, it's estimated at 11.2%. Uh, among Asians, 5.7%, people of more than one race, 10.7%, and among people who identify as Hispanic or Latinx, uh, it's 17%. And these are based on, again, uh, survey, American Community Survey estimates with um, the allowance for some error, plus or minus 10%. So groups that are disproportionately impacted then are females, especially female heads of households, uh, people of color, people with disabilities, uh, and people with already existing chronic medical conditions. So next slide, please. COVID-19. So how has COVID-19 impacted food insecurity in Bucks County? Now, we know it's increased it, and we see, that, see this as evidenced by more people at our food pantries, more people calling 211 to uh, find food support. Uh, but again, we can turn to Feeding America, which has projections around COVID-19. And they say that because of this pandemic, food insecurity among Bucks County residents has increased from 7.1% to 11.4%. Now, 4.3% increase may not seem like a huge jump, but in a county of our size, that represents uh, over 27,000 more people who are food insecure. Um, among children, the estimate is that the rate has gone from 9.4 to 17.8%. Uh, and these, this is a really large number and a challenge for our uh, existing systems to absorb and feed this many more people. In terms of what we're seeing locally uh, at Fresh Connect, uh, the farmer's market that Heather and I both are involved in, um, the attendance skyrocketed from about 350 families pre-pandemic to a high of about 1,500 families uh, per week uh, at the height of the summer. And it's now down to about 950 families a week, but still that is three times what it was this time last year. Next slide, please. So though we don't have access to population level data, uh, one of the uh, key acts of the Hunger Nutrition Coalition of Bucks County is to conduct a 
a survey every other year of people in Bucks County who are utilizing one or more forms of food support. And I should say that the Hunger Nutrition Coalition is a local group that includes agencies and food pantries and volunteers and, and government officials um, all working together informally uh, to fight food insecurity. And again, the, the coalition does a survey every other year. Uh, in 2019, the last year that we did the survey, uh, we had 525 people take the survey and their answers give us a little more insight into who is struggling and how. Uh, so of those surveyed, 48% said someone in the household was working, at least one person in the household was working either for, full or part-time. 88% of the households that we surveyed earned less than $30,000 a year and 55% earned less than $20,000 a year. 58% reported that at least one member in their household has a chronic medical illness, most commonly hypertension or diabetes. 66% report that they sometimes or often worry about running out of food. 49% report that their household members sometimes or often have to skip or reduced meal sizes because of a lack of food in the home. And only 31%, less than a third, report that they're often able to eat a balanced meal. So we also, um, if, excuse me, uh, nutrition is an important aspect of food insecurity. And because we wanna know what the gaps are in the system. We ask people about what kinds of foods they are and are not able to access, even while receiving one or more types of food support. So even with support, 60% um, report they can access fresh, fresh produce, but 40% say they still can't. 61% say they can access vegetables, 39% say they still can't. 53% can access dairy, 43% don't. 70% access proteins and 30% still don't. Um, even with the support from the system, 62% uh, of families felt that they had enough food to provide their families, but 38% still don't feel that way. Uh, and again, with support, 59% felt they could obtain the quality of foods that they would like to feed their families. 41% uh, do not. So we still have a, a, a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, I will say that the ability to access produce um, has increased significantly over the last six years. That's something we're very proud of uh, across the system uh, and the work that uh, the various partners are doing. So I want to uh, close my remarks by talking a little bit about uh, SNAP facts. During uh, her part of the presentation, uh, Heather's going to give us uh, a discussion about some of the different types of assistance that are available in Bucks County. But I'd like to shift gears here as I close and talk about SNAP. Uh, as you know, SNAP is formerly what was called food stamps and it stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, and that's really what it's intended to be, just a supplement. It is not intended to be, uh, to cover a person's entire food budget for uh, a month. And with the average being around $121 a month, you can see why it's, it's not, doesn't carry the full freight. Um, in fact, we see attendance at our food assistance sites increase at the end of the month as people have already spent through their um, SNAP dollars and are looking for other ways to help get by. Um, SNAP is uh, most commonly uh, used by children, seniors, and persons with disabilities. SNAP, uh, unlike the myths that started being perpetrated um, in the 80s, SNAP has a very low level of fraud. In fact, one of the lowest levels of fraud among all government benefits programs. When we look at the impact of SNAP in Bucks County as a whole, we see that in an average month, uh, say January of this, of this year, about 40,000 residents received SNAP collectively about $4,800,000 uh, in each month. So on an annual basis, 
the, uh, that means that SNAP provides about $57 million to Bucks County residents. Uh, it's also important to know that an estimated five to 10,000 people uh, in Bucks County are eligible for SNAP, but they don't apply for the benefit. So then theory that 57 million could be uh, significantly more. And I choose to close with this information on SNAP because in terms of making a, a substantial impact on food insecurity in Bucks County, I see huge potential in doing so through uh, SNAP advocacy. At the federal level, there's always tinkering uh, on around SNAP. Some administrations try to cut or limit benefits. Some administrations try to enhance or expand benefits. Uh, and it just depends on which way the political winds are blowing. Um, but a small change in SNAP benefits either way could see, could bring millions more or millions less into Bucks County. And so in, in my opinion, we're not likely to change the economic conditions that really contribute to food insecurity. And I think that while increasing the number of food drives or opening more food pantries would certainly be helpful, they're not going to make a large enough or sustainable enough impact if we wanna see real change. So I think if there are ways to influence policy around SNAP and make policies more favorable to SNAP recipients, um, that a real impact could be made. So thank you, those are my remarks. Um, I am happy to uh, take questions. Well, thank you so much, Tim. There's some really fascinating data there. Um, and I just, uh, before we move on to Heather, wonder if you could take a minute to kind of explain United Way's role in sort of coordinating and um, overseeing. I mean, obviously you're looking at a big picture, which is very helpful to the rest of us to sort of see the, the scope and, and sort of the nature of, of hunger in, in Bucks County. But if you could explain a little bit more about how United Way coordinates services among the various programs it's not only uh, Opportunity Council and the YWCA. I know there are a number of organizations that address hunger in different ways. And also just very briefly um, explain hunger, uh, Bucks, uh, hunger knocked out by Bucks or Bucks knocks out hunger, uh, just briefly so people understand what that project is about. Sure, sure. So in 2017, United Way of Bucks County uh, chose to move to a collective impact model of change rather than uh, staying a traditional United Way model, which really was a pass through for funds to uh, organizations. We chose to, to concentrate our efforts on, on fewer uh, problem areas and hunger and food insecurity was a problem area where we saw that there was potential for growth and change in Bucks County. Um, so our first uh, order of business was to convene our partners together and uh, get, get around a big table in a room. And we spent uh, a year um, looking at the issue, looking at where the gaps in services uh, were, uh, trying to understand what the uh, resources were. And um, as a result, the consortium of organizations working together uh, came up with the Fresh Connect model, um, which has been, uh, I think we all agree, a, a really successful uh, initiative in Bucks County. And it's successful because it uh, certainly meets an unmet need. And it's successful because all of the organizations, which include St. Mary Medical Center, Phil Abundance, Rolling Harvest Food Rescue, uh, United Way of Bucks County, and with Bucks County Opportunity Council being the lead organization, each of us puts skin in the game. Each of us contributes resources and time. Um, I, as a matter, just as a, an example, I do the program evaluation. Uh, we do fund the program, but but uh, uh, you know, I'm often there uh, collecting data and, and trying to see exactly uh, how the program's working. In terms of Bucks Knocks Down Hunger, that's our annual uh, hunger relief campaign. Uh, we raise funds that allow us to uh, do a couple of things generally, pre-pandemic. We packed meals for food pantries, um, but we also took some of the funds that we were raised that we raised to provide extra funds to the Opportunity Council to help pantries with things like cheese and eggs. Um, we provided Rolling Harvest Food Rescue with some funds so they could procure additional produce to get into food pantries and into the system. Um, and this year we were able to uh, actually we had a very good, successful fundraising year 
in 20, uh, 2020. So we were able to purchase a, a van for Opportunity Council because uh, we're moving as a system so much more uh, food and produce around, we needed the extra, extra set of wheels. Uh, I have one question uh, before we move on. Uh, can you sort of say what you think the difference, how you see the difference between poverty and food insecurity? I mean, the, the, you know, there were only uh, 5% or something in Bucks County seen as, as, pov as poor, as, according to poverty guidelines, and yet 7%, I believe, were food insecure. So how do you explain that difference? Um, I think it is probably um, probably due to how different families manage, uh, you know, finances. Some from, some families may be better able to budget even on uh, a very limited income, so they may be able to more regularly provide uh, food for their family, so that it's not an issue. Now that may they may still struggle with other things like rent and utilities, um, but uh, I think some, some families approach, approach it differently. And um, they also may have some other non-food resources. Uh, Thank you. And I also think the federal poverty guidelines are, having seen them, are incredibly low, that you can probably mm -hmm. be over the poverty guidelines and yet still not be able to afford to eat, at least eat properly, so. But that's absolutely true. And I think Heather uh, will talk a little bit about that phenomenon in, uh, in, in her remarks, but you're absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on to Heather. Um, Heather will tell us, I, I'm sure, about some of the people who come to the Opportunity Council every day facing hunger and food insecurity. She, she can tell us about their needs, the challenges, and how the Opportunity Council is able to, to help them meet some of those challenges. So I'll hand it over to you, Heather. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Ford, Director of Client Services at Bucks County Opportunity Council. And I'm thankful to be here today with all of you and to be able to talk to you about this important issue. Um, the one thing I just wanted to remind you, so BCOC is, you know, that's what, that's what we call ourselves at the Opportunity Council. We have five different program areas that we work on to help reduce poverty in the county. We do emergency services. So if anybody's looking for house, housing or rental assistance. We do programs around that. We do a self-sufficiency program, which can help people um, for training or their employment goals with an end result of trying to get people out of poverty. We have a volunteer income tax assistance program. So it's a volunteer run program that we can allow people at, that are income eligible to get their taxes done at no cost. Um, and then we also have a weatherization program, which uh, helps people with energy and efficiency in their homes, which in, in the end result of that is also to help people reduce their bills for things like that. And then the fifth program is food. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But just wanted to make sure you're aware that we have this, you know, comprehensive approach at Bucks County Opportunity Council. And one thing that helps us with our food program is knowing that we are surrounded by the other programs so that we can help people not only with food, but with their other needs as well. So Bucks County is the lead food agency in Bucks County. We've been identified that by the Bucks County commissioners. And what that really means is that we are the ones that receive the federal and state food program uh, food assistance for the pantry network. So those programs are called the Emergency Food Assistance Program and the State Food Purchase Program. Those are two programs that help the pantry network keep their um, shelves full so that they have enough food coming in for people that need assistance. We also have a program for seniors called the Commodity Supplemental Food Program. That's also a federal program that allows seniors to receive a monthly food box and about 400 people receive that box in the county. We do partner with Phil Abundance. Um, Phil Abundance covers the five county region and we are one of the counties that they cover. We actually have a contract with them to be a redistribution organization. So we receive food from them and then we get it out in the county. So, you know, Phil Abundance likes that relationship because 
their specialty is getting the food in and then our specialty is the relationship that we have with the organizations in the county. So we're very thankful for that partnership with them. As Tim mentioned, we're also the lead agency in the Fresh Connect Collaborative and we do a lot of programs um, to receive private donations. I am the co-chair of the Hunger Nutrition Coalition of Bucks County and that group sits under the BCOC umbrella. Um, in FY 2020, our food program moved 2.4 million pounds of food. So a little bit more on statistics. Um, the meal gap is a term that the Feeding America um, statisticians have come up with. And what that is talking about is the percent of food insecure individuals who may not be eligible for federal food programs like WIC, food stamps, SNAP, or free and reduced lunches. So for Bucks County, our meal gap is 55%, which we are one of the three counties in the state of Pennsylvania that have the highest percent meal gap. Because of this meal gap, we have to rely on charitable contributions to our food program so that we are able to have food resources for people that are food insecure, but may not be eligible for federal food programs. I think the primary reason this exists is the cost of living in Bucks County is so high. So we have people struggling um, to you know, pay their bills and make ends meet, um, even though they're not eligible for programs because the federal income limits are the same across the whole United States. They don't change based on um, different geographic locations. So, you know, what does food assistance look like in Bucks County? I think there's a lot of different ways, but right now, particularly during COVID, we have been fortunate in that we've gotten a lot of resources to us. So, you know, I really want to just stress to people, and I have done this, you know, anytime I can, that if somebody is struggling, you know, please, please have them reach out because there's so much help available right now. It hasn't always been this way. There has been times where we weren't sure if we were going to have enough food, but at least right now, we have a lot of resources coming in. So we would love, you know, anybody who needs help should really, really reach out. There's a food pantry network in the county of over 60 sites. There are community meals in the county. Um, we don't have a soup kitchen or a kitchen that provides daily meals. So they're more of a community meal, which is where churches will have a meal, you know, once a month, every other week, something like that. So that's sort of the way that we try to promote to people where they could go to get a hot meal. Um, as we mentioned, the Fresh Connect, we have three sites in the county, so we're covering upper, central, and lower. There are schools now that are offering pantries. That's becoming more popular. It's a great way to reach families because they're comfortable in that environment of their school. And so, you know, we have been working closely with three schools and we hope to expand that program going forward. Another thing um, that we started because of COVID was an emergency home delivery program. We were getting a lot of calls from people that couldn't leave their home. Either they didn't have transportation, they were scared because of COVID, you know, they were quarantining and they had no way to get out and get food. So we now have a program that you can sign up for to get a, a box of food delivered to you, touch free, um, safely, and we're serving about 75 people a week through that program. Um, and then again, the federal assistance that we talked about, and I you know, agree, I echo what Tim is saying, you know, trying to get people to sign up for SNAP that can. You know, we know that we have the meal gap people that aren't eligible, but then we also still have people that could be benefiting from it. So it's kind of that balance of making sure we're advocating it to the people that can get it, but then having the charitable resources to help the people that aren't eligible for it. Um, so one of the things that we do, so we don't have kind of the huge building, the huge food bank like fill abundance. We have to do our distributions to the network in different ways. Um, this is one way that we do it. Every Thursday in New Britain, we have a distribution that we partner with Rolling Harvest Food Rescue and Applegate Organic and Natural Meats to be able to have pantries come and pick up 
and then take that food back to their pantries. So this is you know, one resource that we are able to provide for pantries each week. Um, obviously these pictures were pre-COVID because <laughs> now we're much more cautious with masks and social distancing, but this is a weekly service. The other thing that's been beneficial of the parking lot distributions is the social capital. The people have come to know each other. That's another way that they're working together. You know, we see pantries sharing resources with each other. And so it's really just become a community. People look forward to coming to these um, and working with each other. In 2016, um, right around the same time that Tim was talking about the coordinated efforts starting, you know, one thing that we quickly realized in the county is we had nowhere to store cold um, produce or frozen items. Many times we've had to turn down donations because we had nowhere to put them. We couldn't start a program like Fresh Connect because we didn't have anywhere to store produce. So we were very thankful and that the county commissioners allowed us to start using a cooler and freezer, a walk-in cooler and freezer at the county warehouse in Central Bucks. And because of that, um, it's now able, you know, we're able to get a lot more food in and out to the pantries and we're able to operate Fresh Connect. So with having the cold storage, we knew we still had a need for dry storage. Um, in 2020, BCOC collaborated with the United Way, St. Mary and Penn Community Bank to open the HELP Center in Bristol. And HELP stands for Healthy Eating and Living Partnership. St. Mary Medical Center had done a needs assessment and we realized that Bristol Township um, is really seen as a food desert. There's a high need there, but there's not a lot of food resources for people living in Bristol Township. Plus we have known that Lower Bucks pantries are always suffering um, because they do have more empty shelves than our other pantries in the county. So we strategically chose the location in Lower Bucks um, and now we've been able to move a lot more food to the Lower Bucks pantries. Um, United Way also uses the site to give home goods out to people who are moving into an apartment or something for the first time. So it's been a great partnership because when people come in for those resources, we can also make sure that they're getting food when they're moving into an apartment. Um, so it's been really wonderful. It's you know still new, but we're looking forward to the different programming we can do out of there. So the, the next slide is our Fresh Connect. So I know we've talked a lot about Fresh Connect, but just wanted to kind of put it on here again. Um, we're very proud of this program. It has definitely filled a void in the county. Um, we were, when we chose this program, we knew that our pantry networks were at capacity. You know, many of them are small, they operate out of a basement or a small room. And so we knew clients wanted more produce, but we were never gonna be able to, you know, upfit pantries to be able to make that change. It would be, you know, they would need more refrigeration. There were so many things that would need to happen. So Fresh Connect became our solution we modeled it after Phil Abundance's program, Fresh for All. And it was really, you know, wonderful. St. Mary did the nutrition education. It was a great partnership. Um, actually, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, I'll talk about it. So I put on here kind of pre-COVID and since COVID. So pre-COVID, you can kind of see, this is our Bristol site. You know, people lined up. Um, they were able to walk through and choose their own produce. It was very much like a farmer's market. We had nutrition education set up. Again, the social capital here was amazing. I mean, people were coming two hours early and just hanging out with each other. It was definitely, you know, like a very family friendly event for people. Now we have had to make it COVID safe. So it is a drive through distribution. Um, and again, as Tim said, our numbers have tripled. We had to increase it to two hours so that we could serve everybody. We are putting a box, a pre-box of food in their trunk so that we don't have any contact. And, you know, we really hope that we can get back to the way we were. I mean, nutrition is very important to what we're doing. And so we definitely want to get back to the nutrition education. 
people love the nutrition education. We've seen it from the comments, um, you know, several food items like spaghetti squash, rutabaga, things like that. People didn't really know how to make. And we did enough education that then people were requesting items like that. And so we know that nutrition education works. And so we definitely want to get back to that. I think another thing that was unique um, during COVID is that we were seeing a whole different crowd of people. Um, we were seeing people that had never asked for assistance before. Um, it was really overwhelming. People were crying, coming through the line. I mean, it was just a really emotional time, specifically like in April, May, whenever things were still very new with the pandemic. Um, so I think that the good thing is we've been able to show them that we're reliable. We never stopped even for one week during the pandemic. We were always open. We did work with the emergency services department of the county and we were able to really provide um, other staples. So we were doing not only produce, but we were doing shelf stable food and we were doing meats and dairies. Um, you can see in the bottom picture on the left, the National Guard was actually helping us during the time that we couldn't have volunteers. So it was really all hands on deck to make sure that it was still happening, um, even you know, during kind of the scariest part of the pandemic. So yeah, I will end on the note of, you know, we definitely could not do what we do without volunteers. Every program that we operate, I think in food requires volunteer help. Um, we had almost 2000 volunteers in the last year with our BCOC food programs and with the Food Pantry Network. So if you're looking for a way to give back or to help, um, I would highly recommend volunteering. It's very rewarding. Um, there's lots of different ways you can help. If you, you know, wanna help with BCOC, our website is on here, but also any pantry that's local to you can always use help. So there's always that opportunity to reach out to your local food pantry as well. Well, that's great, Heather. You, you're doing a tremendous amount, and um, I I have a lot of questions, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to suggest we continue on with Kristen, uh, and then we'll have questions at the end, and people can direct questions to um, all the panelists or any one of the panelists. So uh, let's bring on Kristen. Uh, to tell us about the population that the YWCA serves specifically and to tell us about some of the challenges that may be different for some of, of the Y's um, clients. So Kristen, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for, for hosting this panel and Certainly my partner agencies with United Way and BCOC um, are just three of, of many agencies in Bucks County who are working um, with, with food insecurity. So um, I am the associate director at the YWCA. I've been there um, for, for many years, uh, mainly because um, I love the work that we do. I'm passionate about the mission um, and the community uh, that we serve. So this is just my contact information. If anybody uh, wants to reach out or has questions um, after the panel. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar um, with the YWCA, um, our focus um, is really, and our mission is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, um, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. So our, our three main um, areas of program services are racial and social justice, where we do things like facilitate a racial wealth gap simulation or host community conversations about social justice issues like um, implicit bias or having difficult conversations about race. Uh, we also do professional development um, with local nonprofit organizations um, as well as for-profit organizations around, diver around diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we also do youth and family services. Um, we have um, family center programs, after school programs, um, drug and alcohol education. And finally, um, housing and social services, where we do um, rapid rehousing, where we're moving 
um, primarily female heads of households from uh, homelessness into permanent housing through rental assistance and supportive services. Um, we're doing homelessness prevention right now uh, because there are so many people who are struggling with the COVID pandemic. And just this month, we are opening a um, safe house for victims of human trafficking. Um, but I want to wanted to share all of these with you because I think that there is an intersectionality um, of all of these things, specifically when we're talking about race, um, immigrants, um, and food insecurity. And what's unique about the YWCA um, and our service delivery model is we have what we're called family centers. And these are um, one-stop shop um, you know, services that are embedded within low income communities, primarily low income apartment complexes, where we partner with the management who provides um, space to us at no cost to provide services um, in those communities directly to the residents to remove barriers to accessing services. Um, and I think that that's really unique, particularly in Bucks County when um, some of the barriers to accessing services um, are really, um, you know, transportation is one of the biggest ones. So if we can um, be in the communities where the people that need our services are residing, um, we're able to remove um, that barrier and others providing services. And we also partner with other um, organizations to bring in services to those communities that we um, ourselves don't provide. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so when we're talking about um, immigrants and food insecurity, I wanted to really focus on the impact um, of COVID and some of the key things um, that I wanna highlight with our, our community, and, and these aren't, um, all of these aren't specific to the immigrant community, but some of them are. Uh, many of our families that we're working with on a daily basis um, have had some kind of job loss um, or loss of income or reduced hours. Um, some of our undocumented um, families that we're working with are not eligible for unemployment benefits um, as a result of this job loss or loss of income. Um, we have many people facing health issues. Um, and I think that this speaks to that intersectionality of, you know, race, poverty, and hunger. Um, you know, people who, um, you know, are uh, are in poverty, are, are more likely to be hungry. And if your um, nutrition is not where it needs to be, you're more likely to have health issues. Um, and then, you know, there's also the, the racial disparities, um, you know, that we see with the impact of, of COVID. Um, you know, people, uh, communities of color are, are being um, impacted more significantly, um, you know, than their white counterparts. Um, we're also looking at virtual learning, um, you know, and this is impacting um, a lot of our female heads of households. Their, their children are online learning, um, so they've had to make the difficult choice of staying home with their kids and, and um, you know, having them be able to successfully learn from home or keeping their jobs. So that's a, a really difficult choice that some of our families are having to make, um, as well as a lack of daycare. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the COVID, there, it was very difficult for people to find care for their kids so they, they could work. Um, so these are just, you know, a few of, um, of many different um, things that are impacting. So at the YWCA, all of those programs that we, we spoke about before, our after school programs, all of those continue. Um, but when COVID hit, we really had to shift our focus from traditional programming um, to meet the immediate basic needs of families um, that we're serving. And through our family centers, um, we really have a good pulse on the community because we're in the community. We have staff, um, you know, that are there um, every day. Um, you know, we've been in many of these communities for over 20 um, years. Um, so we have that, um, the ability to, to assess things quickly um, and address needs um, as they come to us. And I will say, um, before we move on to the next slide, that, that we are seeing an increase um, in the request for food um, between our centers, anywhere from, from 20 to 70%, um, depending on the location. Um, so we are seeing a significant um, need in, in our immigrant communities. And Kathy, you can move to the next slide. 
So when we talk about barriers to um, accessing food, um, I've highlighted the, the most significant ones here for you. Um, lack of transportation. Um, anyone here in Bucks County knows that if you don't have your own transportation, um, accessing services, accessing, you know, your um, your traditional food network um, is very difficult. Um, they can't get to the places they need um, to be. Uh, for our immigrant communities, language um, is a barrier. Um, many of the children speak English, but some of the parents um, still have, a, you know, are don't speak English proficiently enough where they feel secure um, to go to a food pantry that they're not familiar with or where someone doesn't speak um, the same language as them. We also want to talk a little bit about fear because um, some of our undocumented immigrants do still um, continue to have a, a fear of leaving their home, um, going to unfamiliar locations, um, you know, where they have a fear of being um, uh, approached by ICE or, um, you know, risk um, the security and safety of their family um, when leaving their home. Um, physically, um, some of our families um, cannot carry the food that we have available um, for distribution, whether it's um, ability or sometimes we have a mom who will come with um, an infant and two toddlers. Um, you know, without a car, um, you know, walking to the center. Um, so it's very difficult for them if we have the food available to carry the volume of food that they need to support their family on a weekly basis, um, you know, back um, to their homes. Um, you know, a lot of uh, families need to be home during the day, um, during virtual learning for their children, and they can't really leave their kids at home unattended um, to go out to the food pantries um, or to some of the other um, available food to be able to get what they need. Um, and then a big one for us right now is dietary restrictions um, due to, to religion or culture. Um, we're seeing a lot of families from Central and South America, Asia, the Middle East, India, um, you know, and it's not just food insecurity for families, but it's um, dignity around their culture and being able to provide food that's respectful and, and observes um, their religion, um, you know, accessing um, things through the pantry. And, and I'll just give an example. Um, some of our Muslim families, um, you know, observe halal, which basically means permissible, um, you know, under Islamic law about what they, they can and cannot eat, um, you know, no pork, no meat from hindquarters. So, um, you know, some of our, our pantries and, and our offerings don't always um, take those cultural um, and religious restrictions um, into consideration um, when we're providing food to families. Kathy, we can move to the next one. So, so what are we really doing um, to lift the barriers to meet the needs um, of families in our community? And I'm gonna just speak to um, what the YWCA is doing. I'm sure that there are, are other organizations who um, are doing similar things, but you know, we're distributing food directly in the communities where people live and we're, we're utilizing um, our partnerships and our relationships and leveraging our um, our contacts in the community to provide um, the distribution right through our family center. So we are removing some of those barriers um, when we talk about transportation. Um, the YWCA has staff that speak multiple languages, um, including Arabic, Russian, uh, Spanish. Um, the um, staff members um, are wonderfully dedicated. They have uh, been working with these, the communities in which they serve for many, many years, and they are a trusted ally of the immigrant community. So we're removing that fear um, that people have by being present, being in the community, being visible, um, lending a helping hand. Um, and, and I think Heather talked a lot about, um, you know, the social impact. Um, the staff at the YWCA who work in the family centers who have been with us for, for many, many years are seen as leaders in the community and, and they are, um, you know, trusted individuals where uh, families can come to them not only for food, for, but for other services um, as well. Um, we also purchase carts to transfer 
export um, food home for families that they can borrow and bring back to us, you know, um, I think I mentioned before, we, you know, some of our space at the family centers, um, you know, there, it, a lot of it is um, donated apartment space. So if you can imagine, um, you know, distributing food out of a two bedroom apartment on the second floor or in a basement apartment, um, you know, we, we really leverage uh, all of our resources and we're really creative in, in how we're able to do that. But, um, you know, if, if you have a mother that's coming with an infant and two toddlers in a stroller, they have a little basket on the bottom that they might be able to put food in, but they physically can't carry um, the food home with them. So we purchase those little grocery carts, just, you know, a simple fix. Um, that makes such a significant difference to families and they can borrow it and bring it back. Um, we're actually delivering food to families who cannot come to the center. So if for uh, families who have a disability or they have to stay home um, with their families, they can connect directly with our family center coordinators on site and say, hey, listen, I can't make it there. Um, I have to be home. Um, we're also adjusting our hours. If people need to come after work hours, we're, we're being flexible and making appointments um, after work hours so people can come to the center when they're available, not just when um, we, we want to be available. Um, and then really purchasing food that aligns with participants' religion and culture. And we have um, Rowena Jaff, who is our family center coordinator at Creekside, has done a wonderful job advocating um, for her families um, at that center and, and came to us and said, hey, listen, um, you know, the families that we're serving um, need food that can, um, you know, meet their cultural needs. Um, and it's not always the, the rice and the pasta and the, you know, canned vegetables and the, the chicken breasts or whatever we have at the food pantry. Sometimes it's rice or masa or um, cook specific cooking oils or, or spices. Um, and we have um, tried to, to balance uh, providing the volume of food that, that we can to meet the needs of the community, but also go, physically going out to um, specialty stores to purchase things um, that meet the specific needs of the, the individuals who are living in our communities. So um, I think that that's a big one for the YWCA and all, also our, our mission um, of making sure that we're, we're meeting the cultural needs of families and, and maintaining that dignity for them to provide food for their families. So just to give you a snapshot of the food programs that the YWCA is doing right now. Um, we have our traditional food pantry at Country Commons, which is in Ben Salem, which is part of the food pantry network that Heather was talking about um, that BCOC oversees in the county. So we're one of just many, many pantries um, in Bucks County where people can come to. We have um, weekly distributions um, at those centers, but also um, emergency by appointment. If someone needs to come on a day other than um, our traditional day, we certainly accommodate um, those families. Um, as a result of COVID, we've also um, added some pop-up emergency food pantry uh, at Bucks Meadow and Creekside um, Family Centers in Ben Salem and also Aspen Grove in Warminster. And we applied for some CARES Act funding um, because we were seeing the significant um, increase in requests for uh, food at these centers. Um, while we are able to distribute uh, food at the, those centers, um, we, it's not a fully functioning pantry like a country commons where we have cold food storage. We're, we're really able to um, distribute um, shelf stable food. Um, and also, um, you know, if there are um, opportunities to bring fresh produce um, or milk um, through our partnership with BCOC and, um, you know, Fresh Connect, uh, we're able to do that as well. Um, we're also doing um, nutritional development um, meal distribution, which is um, a partnership with the Archdiocese of Philadelphia where we're providing uh, meals for children under the age of 18. These are meals that kids would normally um, get at school, breakfast and lunch, but maybe because of virtual learning, um, they're not getting those meals. So without these meals, um, some of these children would not eat during the day. So we do a weekly distribution at the five centers um, and they get uh, five breakfasts and five lunches 
for the week. Um, and you can imagine it's a gigantic uh, box of food, um, you know, for to help sustain the kids um, throughout the week. And then the YWCA is actually with other funding sources providing weekend food bags for the youth to supplement the NDS. So we're trying to mimic what they um, are providing um, to give kids a little extra nutrition um, over the weekend. And then of course, we're working with our partner agencies, referrals to Fresh Connect and the Help Center, um, and, and frankly, any other services that we're able to connect people with. Um, this is just to give you a little snapshot by the numbers, and, and I will have to say that, that these numbers, this is a, in a response to COVID, um, and these numbers really just go through January through October of 2020, so there have been an increase in these numbers um, since then, but the YWCA has provided uh, 486 families um, with uh, over 1,300 emergency food bags at the five locations. You know, in addition, we've attributed um, probably over 20,000 meals at this point to, um, you know, over 800 children um, at the centers while school is not in session. Um, so, you know, the numbers are, are significant. And if you imagine this is just what one organization is doing, if you amplify um, this um, with all of the organizations in the network who are doing similar services, I think that we really are um, making a tremendous impact. And, you know, it takes all of us, it takes, um, you know, United Way um, um, with Fresh Connect, um, at, and BCOC and all of the agencies working together in partnership um, to make sure that we're need, meeting the needs of those um, most significant in the county. So I wanted to just end with just a, two quick stories um, of families that have been directly impacted. Um, the first one is an immigrant family um, who is seeking asylum um, in the United States um, since November. Um, dad hasn't been working. He lost his job due to a lack of work. So um, mom cooks Mexican food um, to sell on the weekend and they're using that money to sustain the family. Um, and you can imagine, um, you know, in addition to the, the cost of food, rent, utilities, and all of the other basic needs that people need um, to survive, it's, it's not a lot. Um, so this particular family is just thrilled to, to be able to access food um, through um, the food pantry items. We did some grocery gift uh, cards around the holidays and obviously, you know, just to, um, you know, give people a, a 360 degree approach to, to services, you know, we're providing parenting and after school programs for her, for her children um, as well. And the second story is one that I referenced earlier. We have a, a Muslim family that um, resides at one of our centers, um, you know, that the, you know, the food must be halal for, um, you know, under their law. And um, our family center coordinator connected directly with the family to really assess like what their dietary needs were and then advocated for that family so we can make sure that we have those um, those items available for families um, in our pantry. So, um, you know, from the from the ground level, I think it's really important to make sure that we're listening to the needs um, of the family and responding accordingly. Well, thank you. I, I it's, it's amazing uh, how much work you've all been doing this past year in particular. I know you've been doing it for years, but and the impact I can't imagine uh, what people would have done without the services that have been provided through your organizations and the whole network of organizations here in the county, I guess most of whom, if not all of whom are on the, the Hunger Nutrition um, uh, Council. Uh, and uh, I do have some questions. Uh, uh, some people have been asking questions, which is great. Um, and uh, some could be answered by all of you, but one I think for, uh, for Heather, uh, someone's interested in knowing uh, more about your nutrition education. It makes a comment convincing someone to like rutabagas is a huge success, but that's a personal <laughs> comment. Um, but uh, I think, it, did you say St. Mary's? So, yes, we partner with St. Mary Medical Center, Doylestown Health, and Rolling Harvest Food Rescue. All three of those entities have nutritionists on staff. 
And so they would come to Fresh Connect, set up a table, they would make a sample out of one of the things that we're giving out that day and then have that recipe. So you were getting to taste it and you were getting the recipe. And so, you know, for the rutabaga, you know, even now I know you just treat it like a potato, <laughs> but that's kind of, you know, we were able to teach everybody that. And then people were requesting things like that. And it's just really wonderful to see um, like that desire to cook. We see that a lot from people saying, you know, we've had people tell us, you know, I, ha I stopped cooking. Now I'm getting my cookbooks out and I'm cooking again. So I think it's just that mental, you know, it helps people mental well-being as well. And uh, someone asked about um, where the food pantries are. And I, I think you said there were about 60 of them mm -hmm. uh, located. And I, I imagine these are all, some are out of churches. I mean, are, are some of the, a lot of these are kind of uh, small um, kind of projects that people yeah. sort of decide to take on. Is that correct? Correct. And if you look in the chat, the Bucks County Opportunity Council Food Programs website, we have all the pantries, locations, and hours on our website. And so you can look there. We have it, you know, set out by Upper Central and Lower Bucks, and that's where you can see the whole list and their hours of operation. And a kind of related question, um, are people, is there any limit? I mean, can people come to the food pantries any time? Are there any eligibility requirements? Does anybody ask them where they came from? Or I guess it may depend on the pantry, but mm -hmm. in general, would you say there's any sort of qualifications required or yeah. uh, so, eligibility? Right, so it, it is open to anybody who resides in Bucks County. Um, there is a self-certification form for income. So we just ask people to sign off that they are at or below a certain income level, but that's the only requirement. So I know there was a question about undocumented individuals. They can be yes. served. They can be served at food pantries. They do not have to have documentation. Um, generally coming into a food pantry is your proof that you're, a, a, you know, you're within proximity and can be served. And so anybody can come. Um, we do ask for Fresh Connect that you go to one a week instead of like going to all three. But other than that, even if somebody would come though, we would still serve them. And you can go to multiple pantries. There's nothing that would stop you from doing that if you need that extra help. And again, this is, well, this is for anyone, but do you see there being one part of the county where um, that's what you call underserved? I mean, are there some areas that are more difficult uh, to to get food to or more or that you feel that p people aren't able to access food in a particular part of the county or are you pretty much all over the place? Well, I mean, I think we chose Ottsville, for example, for our Upper Bucks Fresh Connect site because that upper part of the county is very rural and mm -hmm. there's not a lot of services available for people. Um, so we chose that location because, you know, we could have chose Quakertown, but we chose Ottsville because we thought we would be kind of getting another niche of people. Um, and Quakertown does have quite a few services already available. Bristol Township is also another place that has the high need of people mm -hmm. and a low amount of services available. So that was why we chose the Fresh Connect Bristol site in Bristol Township as well. Now, I know a lot of money has flowed in um, through the um, COVID relief uh, bills. Uh, and that you, I think someone said, unlike some years when there aren't enough resources that you have more resources now. Do you know how long that's going to last? I imagine in this new act that's in, in the Senate right now, that there will be more monies coming in. I don't know whether there are any monies designated for, uh, for direct relief in the way, you know, in the, in like food um, pantries and things like that. But do you, I mean, at some point it's probably going to end, correct? And do you know when and how how long you have to, to be getting these extra monies? Uh, you know, I don't think we have an exact end date and it is kind of, you know, it does make us nervous because we know the numbers aren't going down. Um, so they're definitely not going down to pre-COVID numbers. 
So we are worried <laughs> that, you know, if, if this extra help stops, that we won't have enough resources to help people. The current COVID, our CARES money is through December 31st, 2021. So we feel like we will have some extra support at least through that time period. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know anything beyond that point right now. And I, I will just add that, you know, during this time, we have seen such a generous outpouring of individuals and groups who want to help. Um, so we have been getting donations, as I'm sure uh, BCOC and United Way have as well, of people who call and say, hey, you know, I know people are struggling, people are hungry, what do you need? And they will go out and they will put a specific list together and they will pull folks together and get the donations, deliver them to us and help us to distribute them. So the outpouring of, of support from the community, I think has just been wonderful. Yes. But it's kind of like Thanksgiving, you know, everybody wants to work in the food, you know, in the, in the food, the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving, and then, then they, you know, then January and February comes, yeah. but let's hope that, uh, you know, let's hope that this will promote a, a greater awareness, uh, and that, and that will, people can, will continue to support. Tim, did you have anything to say about your, your thoughts about how, how long this extra help is going to last or any thoughts the United Way has about how to make sure that um, after the relief monies are spent that that there will be ongoing uh, support for these efforts? Well, I wish there were an easy answer. I think um, like Heather, like many of the nonprofits that we work with, people are kind of taking it day by day and month by month. Uh, the December 31, 2021 deadline is uh, looms for not only food support, but for uh, some types of housing. Uh, so yeah, we're, we are concerned about what will happen in 2022 if benefits retract, but the need uh, remains high. Uh, so I think at United Way, we are trying to remain as flexible uh, as we can. Throughout this year, we, we um, had hosted a COVID-19 recovery fund, which allowed our nonprofit partners to apply for funds uh, for basic needs for uh, clients that they were serving. Uh, and this was a rapid response fund so that we could move dollars really very quickly. And we were only able to establish it because donors generously stepped up and said, you know, we want to help folks who are impacted by covid can you direct these dollars to where they're needed most? Well, I know one of the, you know, one of the benefits that's out there that, uh, you know, that you've mentioned uh, is SNAP uh, and the fact that there are monies that are being left on the table. And uh, there was a question about, is there, I know you, you talked about advocacy for SNAP, but uh, what, what specifically can be done or is being done to, um, to encourage people to make them aware they are eligible and to encourage them to take advantage of these benefits that are there for them. Yeah. yeah. E e either anyone. Oh. <laughs> you know, I was just gonna say, um, I know that, um, you know, when our staff at the YWCA work with um, any of our participants for any programs, you know, one of the first things we do is, at, is try to connect them with any mainstream benefits that they are eligible for, including SNAP. And we will help them, um, you know, walk through the process, you know, help them to determine whether or not they're eligible, help them complete the application um, if they have barriers um, to language. So we do have the, um, the capability and capacity to assist people um, in applying for their benefits. And we do do outreach uh, when folks connect to us uh, for really any service that we provide. I think though we have many people who aren't connected to any other services uh, that probably would fall into the eligible mm -hmm. categories. And it's really difficult to identify who these folks are and get information out to them. Uh, there are also re other reasons that people choose not to apply, even if they are aware of it. Applications can be very difficult. Um, some people still feel a stigma around asking for support and choose not to. And yet others um, take have a belief that if they're getting by, 
they don't want to take the benefit away from somebody else, uh, which uh, really doesn't work that way. But um, yeah, that, it's something sometimes to convince people of that. And uh, Heather, do you have any thoughts on, on how to get more people to sign up for SNAP? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, again, it's just promoting it and letting people know. I mean, you know, there's like, for example, seniors on fixed incomes, they may only be eligible for $16 a month or $20 a month. And so they may not feel like it's worth their time to sign up for something like that. So, you know, we try to just let them know that it is worth it. <laughs> you know, there is a benefit. So even if um, their monthly allocation is small, the program does allow you to um, let your allocations uh, come together for six months so that you'd have more available for say a holiday or a special occasion. So just kind of promoting the program and we try to do that as much as possible. Um, and we'll help people um, if they're having trouble applying as well at our agencies. Someone asked um, whether there was a particular uh, need for a particular kind of food or uh, to, to donate, to give to the pantries. What's the most effective way to give to a pantry? I know you always need cash uh, <laughs> and that, that gives you the flexibility mm -hmm. to purchase what you need. Mm -hmm. But if people want to donate food, how would they do it and what, what do you need most? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would recommend, you know, if you want to donate to your local pantry, I'd recommend giving them a call. I think each pantry is a little bit different. As Kristen mentioned, you know, for example, her pantry does have those religious and cultural needs. So that might be a little bit different than another pantry. So I think your best bet is to call um, BCOC. We accept donations. You know, we do have uh, lists that you can use for most needed items. Um, the Hunger Nutrition Coalition also created a healthy guide to donating food. So, you know, we always encourage people to donate like spices and oils. Those are kind of higher priced items that people may not think of donating. Um, so things like that are probably more the more unique things, you know, the cans of vegetables, cans of fruit, things like that we're getting from our government assistance. So, you know, we try to recommend that people donate things that are um, different than the things that we're getting from the government help. And also, if I might, low salt, reduced mm -hmm. sugar uh, mm -hmm. for people who are on special diets. Mm -hmm. Good point. Always, you know, nutritious food, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, over the bags of Cheetos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because we know that m the most inexpensive food is the stuff that's usually not very good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, families who are have a fixed income or have a limited, um, you know, budget to purchase food tend to purchase the, um, you know, the, the less nutritious food. So we want to, to be able to, you know, supplement that with whatever we can um, in the high nutrition area at the pantries. A couple of people have asked questions about advocating for, you know, better public policy, you know, laws uh, that would help in this area. And we are going to have, uh, this is the first of three sessions around hunger. Mm -hmm. And uh, our last session, we're going to focus more on advocacy and, and how, what we can do to, to change policies and, and bring more government aid and more government attention to this to this uh, area. But any of the three of you, if you had, you know, a wish list, what would you hope for from, you know, local, state, federal government that would uh, make this problem, make it your jobs in addressing this problem easier and, and more possible? Anyone I'm going to make a in? quick pitch right now, Liz, for the basic needs committee of the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition, because these are exactly the things that the basic needs committee are, are looking at and, you know, following um, state and, and federal legislation that could impact um, families. So I'm going to make a pitch there. Um, you know, I'm not the expert on public policy. Um, so I'm going to, uh, you know, toss this back to, to one of my other panelists, but I would say that, you um, that would be a good starting place for individuals who are interested in getting involved in, in advocacy around um, basic needs and nutrition. Okay. 
Tim or Heather, either of you want to uh, wade in on either things that you know are in the works mm -hmm. or um, uh, or ideas that, that you've heard about that you think are, are, should be advocated for or promoted? I don't know of specific legislation um, that, you know, that's on the table now, uh, but I always stay in touch with the uh, Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger um, as they are very strong in, in, uh, in the area of advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I know about SNAP is uh, dwarfed by what our colleagues there know about SNAP. Uh, and I think it would, it would uh, probably make people's heads spin when they realize how complicated and nuanced the program can be. Um, in terms of uh, advocacy, I, I certainly think, you know, basics, meeting with your elected officials, letting them know that you believe food insecurity is a problem and ask them to uh, prioritize it. Good point. Heather, do you have any uh, Yeah, ideas? I mean, you know, the same thing that Tim mentioned, you know, we really value our partnership with Kathy Fisher at the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. So we, you know, she luckily kind of keeps us in on the details of things. And uh, I, we also partner with state organizations, Feeding Pennsylvania, um, the Hunger Free Pennsylvania, and groups like that. So we've definitely found that working together and having all of our local groups um, partner and, and advocate together. As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, the State Food Purchase Program is a Pennsylvania program. There's also a program called PASS, which is Pennsylvania Agricultural Surplus System. Both of those funds come down to us to provide resources to the pantries. Those are two programs that we're always looking for people to, you know, show their state legislators that they're supporting those programs because again, it is the majority of what helps keep food on the pantry shelves throughout the year. So those are the two programs that we are always pushing for people to support. Um, but I think Tim is right. I mean, we have meetings a lot of times with local elected officials or state officials or federal officials and they love hearing, you know, what's happening at the local level and they like hearing stories and how it's benefiting people. And a lot of times it's just us educating them on how what they're doing at their level is impacting us and impacting our clients. And so just help us to get the word out and meet with people as much as possible. Well, it sounds, uh, it, it sounds like there have been some great partnerships uh, going on in this county and and both county and private nonprofits working together, it seems very effectively mm -hmm. right now. So um, kudos to all of you. And uh, I wanna thank each and every one of you for contributing so much to this morning's conversation about hunger and food insecurity in Bucks. And it is a, it's really sobering to learn how serious a problem it is for so many families in our county. It's wonderful to hear that so many people are out there trying to help them every day, um, but it's too bad that uh, that's, it's such a problem that, that we're having to deal with. But thank you again and uh, getting us started on a conversation which we hope to continue uh, in the weeks to come. And um, again, uh, thanks for joining us and making this such an interesting conversation. Thanks. So Liz. I will, you're very welcome. So you're welcome anytime. I hope you can join us for the next two presentations. And I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Jean to wrap it up. Um, I don't, yeah, there we go. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Bucks County, I'd like to thank Tim and Kristen and Heather for a really informative program with lots of good things to think about. This session has been recorded and will be available on the League's website and on our Facebook page. Um, this is the first of three programs, as Liz mentioned, each of which will cover different aspects of the problem of hunger in Bucks County. The second program will be on March 20th, 
and it will focus on the issue of hungry students, students from kindergarten through college. This is another sort of hidden demographic of, of people who are suffering from hunger in our county. The third program will be on April 10th, and it will help us understand what is being done in Bucks County to help alleviate this problem and what we as individuals and organizations can do to help. So we'll get into some specifics of where to go from here. Uh, all of the people who uh, tuned in today will receive a follow-up email in a day or so, which will have information about signing up for the other two programs. And it will also include a short survey to help us design future programs and we'd appreciate the feedback if you could send it back. I'd also like to invite you to join our league. We're a nonpartisan group. We're open to both men and women, and we're committed to creating and promoting a diverse and inclusive environment in our organization. So I hope you will consider joining us. And thank you again for coming today.